Now we connect the second E, energy, to the economy and embark on the precise line of thinking that led me to completely change my lifestyle, and I call it energy economics. It is my background as a scientist, particularly one trained in the natural sciences, that guides me the most here. Studying living things and natural systems quickly leads to the very obvious conclusion that everything grows larger right up to the limits of the energy it has available to it. Animal populations expand up to the limits of their available food supply, but no more, and plants cannot grow at all without sunlight, which is their primary source of energy. Tilting this view slightly, suppose I put you on a desert island and give you every possible resource in the world, all the minerals, all the money, gold, silver, diamonds, anything and everything you could want, but no energy. And that means no food either, which contains chemical energy, and no oil, no electricity, no coal. What could you do? Well, you could use up the energy stored in your body, but once that was gone, you'd be able to do nothing at all. You'd have no economy on your little island, even though surrounded by unimaginable resources and wealth. The economist Julian Simon once proclaimed that energy is the master resource. And this means that energy is the absolutely essential input at the beginning of each and every economic unit of production and every transaction. I suppose this just makes common sense, but we live so completely surrounded by energy in all its forms that in order to notice the way it touches every minute of our waking day, it has to be pointed out. And the central point to this chapter is this. As we've shown in previous chapters of the crash course, our global economy depends on continual growth to function. And not just any kind of growth, but exponential growth. But in order to grow, it must receive an ever-increasing input supply of affordable energy and resources from the natural world. What I'm about to show you is a preponderance of data that indicates those inputs will just not be there in the volumes needed to supply the growth that the world economy is counting on. In short, on top of all of the debt and other economic messes we've made for ourselves, constraints from the natural world will increasingly place limits on economic growth in a way we haven't had to deal with over the past century, or ever. This is why I'm so confident in the claim that the next 20 years will be completely unlike the past 20. So understanding the dynamics at play here is key to forecasting what the future will be like. Since energy is the master resource, that's where we're going to start. Before 1870, the world got nearly 100% of its energy from biomass, trees and peat moss and things like that, and the world's population stood at just 1.3 billion. But then coal use exploded onto the scene, and then 50 years after that, oil began to occupy a significant portion of the energy mix. Since the first use of fossil fuel energy, which is a stored form of chemical energy, which means it's the same as food in the larder, the global population has expanded more than five times, total energy use by 18 times, and the world's economy by more than 80 times. Now, take a look at this chart of global energy use by source or type of energy. Its shape should be familiar to you by now. It's nonlinear. Everything we think we know about how the economy, our ease of life, and the way the world works was formed during a period when the most massive liberation of stored chemical energy, in the form of fossil fuels, of course, occurred. The world's main energy source was all biofuels up to 1860, and then coal began to sneak in in 1870, but did not make up half the energy mix until 1910, a full 50 years later. And even though it was first drilled in 1869, oil did not become a full third of the energy mix until 1960, more than 90 years later. And natural gas first starts to sneak onto the picture in 1910, but has not yet achieved parity with coal and oil, although it's getting close. The point here is that energy transitions from one energy source to the next take many decades, and for a good reason. Each form of energy has a huge amount of embedded capital tied up in it. Even though steamships were far more cost-effective, it took decades before the final sailing ships rotted away into disuse. Ditto for the transition from coal to oil for transportation. Likewise, we should expect that any transition to solar energy will take many decades, a minimum of four, but perhaps as many as six or even ten. The question here is, do we have that much time? The connection I'm drawing here is both simple and immensely important. Both human population and the global economy expanded to their current size primarily because of fossil fuel energy. With sufficient surplus energy, humans can construct remarkably complex creations in short order, as these pictures of oil-rich Dubai taken only 17 years apart can attest. 
Now we can state the next key concept of the crash course. Social complexity relies on surplus energy. By extension, so does economic complexity. Societies that unwillingly lose either their social or economic complexity, or both, are notoriously unpleasant places to live in. Given this, shouldn't we be paying close attention to just how much surplus energy we've got and what we're using it for? To illustrate this important concept, let's take a quick tour through the idea of energy budgeting. It's the same as household budgeting, but we're budgeting energy here instead of dollars, and it works like this. At any given time, there's a defined amount of energy that's available for us to use as we wish. Let's put everything into this square. Solar and wind and hydro, nuclear, coal, petroleum, natural gas, perhaps a tiny spot of algae, and anything else I've happened to miss. That's our total pool of energy to use any way we wish. But if we want to have more energy next year, we obviously have to invest some of our current energy into producing tomorrow's energy. We must also invest some of today's energy in building and maintaining the capital structure that allows us to collect and distribute the energy we use to maintain our complex society. Roads and pipelines and bridges and electrical pylons and buildings all go into this category. What's left over can be used for consumption. Part of this goes into basic living needs such as water and food and shelter, leaving the rest for discretionary things like uh, trips to the Galapagos or purchasing hula hoops or tiny racing sailboats. Now to simplify this even more, we can divide energy up into two big buckets. Energy that must be reinvested to keep everything going, and energy that we can more or less choose what to do with. This is exactly analogous to your earnings. Suppose your household earns $50,000 per year and your total taxes are 30%. This leaves you $35,000 to buy food and pay for your shelter, or purchase gasoline for your car, and maybe do a few other things besides. If this suddenly flipped around, however, and you found yourself with only $15,000 of take-home pay, your situation would change drastically. Perhaps you could only afford food and shelter now, while the car and new electronics and vacations became mere distant memories. Your life would be forcibly simplified in terms of the number of things you could afford to buy or do. It would be unpleasant. So I want you to begin to think of the amount of energy that we have to reinvest in order to get more energy as the same thing as a tax on your salary. And here's why. Forget all about how much money energy costs because it's actually irrelevant, especially when money is printed out of thin air. Instead, we're going to focus on how much energy it takes to get energy because as I'm going to show you, that is what really matters. Fortunately, the concept's easy and it's called net energy. The first is that we shouldn't really concern ourselves only with the amount of oil that comes out of the ground. What we should really keep our attention on is the net energy we get from it meaning the energy that's left over after we deduct what we had to use to get the energy in the first place. To illustrate this, suppose I told you that we had just found 100 billion barrels of oil in the ground. That would be awesome, right? Now, what if I told you it was in the center of the Earth and would cost us 200 billion barrels of oil to go and get it? Oops, that would mean we'd be using more energy to get the oil than we'd be getting in return, and that means it would be a losing proposition. The important point here is that society does not run on the total amount of energy, but the surplus energy that's left over. As soon as you are spending one barrel to obtain one barrel, there's no surplus energy, also called net energy, to go around for the rest of society to use in all the myriad ways that we collectively call the economy. As you drive around on smooth roads and over gigantic iron bridges, walk into stores and see the incredible displays of material abundance to purchase, or look up and see planes crisscrossing the sky, I invite you to look beyond the obvious and see the energy that makes all of that possible. For this chapter, we're going to measure net energy by dividing the amount of energy we get by the amount of energy that we had to use in order to get that energy. Energy out over energy in. Energy in is the tax, while energy out is our take-home pay. Imagine that if the total energy it took to get an oil well drilled was one barrel of oil and a hundred barrels was found. We'd say that our net energy return was 100 to 1. In this example, the tax we paid was 1 out of 100, or 1%. Another phrase for this that you will frequently encounter is energy returned on energy invested, which goes by the acronym EROEI. We're just going to stick with energy out divided by energy in for this section as it's easier to visualize and it's essentially the same thing. 
Now, let's make this visual by graphically comparing the relationship between energy out and energy in. The red part is the amount of energy we put in, and the green part is how much we got out, or the net energy. And we're displaying them such that they always sum to 100%. In the first scenario, the energy out divided by energy in yields a value of 50, meaning that one unit of energy was used to find and produce 50 units of energy. In other words, 2% was used to find and produce energy, leaving us with a net 98% to use however we saw fit. We could also call this part the surplus energy available to society. Even at a net energy ratio of 15, the surplus energy available to society remains quite high. The surplus energy, of course, is what supports all of our economic growth and technological progress and all of our wonderfully rich and complicated society. Now, I want to draw your attention to what happens over here on this part of the chart between the readings of 10 and 5. The net energy available to society begins to drop off in a manner that should be familiar to you after seeing the section on exponential charts. Only this hockey stick points down. Below a reading of 5 and the chart heads down in earnest, hitting 0, when it gets to a reading of 1. That is, when it takes one unit of energy to get one unit of energy, there's zero surplus, and there's really no point in going through all the trouble of getting it. Below a reading of 5, and we are on the energy cliff. To find out why this is an enormously important chart, let's look at our experience with net energy with respect to oil. In 1930, for every barrel of oil used to find oil, it's estimated that 100 were produced, giving us a reading of 100 to 1, which would be way off this chart to the left. By 1970, fields were a lot smaller, and oil often deeper, otherwise trickier to extract, and the net energy gain was now down to a value of around 25 to 1. Still, a very good return with lots of green beneath it. By the 1990s, this trend continued with oil fields returning uh, somewhere between 18 and 10 to 1. And today, it's estimated that recent oil finds are returning somewhere between 10 to 1 and 3 to 1 net energy. Why is the net energy dropping? Because in the past, a relatively small amount of energy was required to create the metal for a small rig, and the finds were massive, plentiful, and relatively shallow. Today, much more energy is required to find energy. Exploration ships and rigs are massive. If we put our humble 1930s rig to scale, it looks like this. And today, more wells are being drilled to greater depths to find and produce smaller and smaller fields, all of which weigh upon our net energy. And not only is harvesting oil from these more challenging deposits more costly, it also introduces a much higher degree of risk. When failure occurs, as the Deepwater Horizon proved to us, the economic and ecological costs can skyrocket. And what about the allegedly massive amounts of oil contained within the so-called tar sands and oil shales, the ones that are often described as equivalent to several Saudi Arabias? We'll talk about these in greater depth in coming chapters, but for now, We'll simply note the net energy values for these are especially poor and in no way comparable to the 101 returns found in Saudi Arabia. Further, the water and environmental costs associated with them are disturbingly high. While the evidence on net energy returns of nuclear power is conflicting, it's safe to say that the old-fashioned boiling water reactors of the type that failed spectacularly at Fukushima in 2011 is a lot less than what newer designs might offer. Once full cycle cleanup and decommissioning costs are factored in, all we can say is that the jury is still out on nuclear at this point. And what about renewable energy sources? Methanol, which can be made from biomass, sports a net energy of about 3, while biodiesel offers a net energy return of somewhere around 2. Corn-based ethanol, if we're generous, might produce a net energy return of just slightly over 1, but could also be negative according to some sources. If we add in all the other new sources for usable liquid fuels that we just talked about, we see that they are all somewhere over here on the face of the cliff. Unless we very rapidly find ways of boosting the net energy of these options, we'll simply find far less surplus energy for our basic needs and discretionary wants. Solar and wind are both capable of producing pretty high net returns, but these are producing electricity, not liquid fuels, for which we already have an extensive investment in distribution and use. Oh, and by the way, where's the so-called hydrogen economy on here? It's right here, because there are no hydrogen reservoirs anywhere on Earth. Every single bit of it has to be created from some other energy source at a loss. In other words, hydrogen is an energy sink, not a source. In creating and then using hydrogen, we lose energy, and that's not pessimism. 
That's the law. The second law of thermodynamics, to be exact. Because hydrogen is a carrier of energy, not a source. It is more accurately described like this. A battery. Now, to make an absurd argument, because nobody would be this foolish, suppose Congress made the decision to, say, try and run our society on corn-based ethanol. What could we expect there? Well, if we adjust our graph to reflect that decision, we see a whole lot of red and very little green. The tax is very high, while our take-home pay is very low. By way of commentary, I find it somewhat telling that out of all the possible alternative energy sources, this is the one that Congress chose to advance with billions and billions in subsidies. I mean, short of directly launching barrels of oil into outer space, it's hard to imagine a more energetically foolish decision. An important point here is that even if the government completely subsidized ethanol to the point that it only cost you a penny a gallon to buy, we would soon find ourselves living in a shrunken, ruined economy. And the reasons why have already been covered. With less surplus energy, less societal complexity is possible. Under an ethanol regime, we'd find many cherished job positions would simply vanish. Regulatory compliance specialists for food additives would have to revert to being farmers. Pediatric radiological oncologists would become healers. Uh, patent attorneys specializing in narrow technological fields would uh, have to find something else to do. And so on. If we tried to live on ethanol as a liquid fuel, unemployment would skyrocket, living standards would plummet, and we'd quickly lose nearly all of the specialized jobs that we associate with modern society because there would be practically no surplus energy to use. Because of their low net energy, ethanol and other such poor energy sources are thoroughly incompatible with our current lifestyles. This becomes this. Let's review the two key concepts so far before moving on. The price of energy is irrelevant. Net energy is everything. On this basis, both corn-based ethanol and hydrogen are dismal failures, no matter how well we prosecute them. Next, social complexity is built upon surplus energy. If we want to maintain our society in its current form, we are going to have to master this concept, and fast. Now that you have a firm grasp of energy economics, let's turn to the energy source at the heart of the world's economy, oil. We are living at a pivotal point in history regarding this critical resource. Please join me for the next chapter, Peak Cheap Oil. Thank you for listening.